excited uh, to be able to have Todd Peterson. He's actually brought some of his partners uh, with him today. Um, I have known Todd for a number of years, but I've known about his company probably almost from the very beginning. And I can tell you that uh, Vivint is only, you only know probably about a third or a quarter or a fifth of uh, what it does and what it's capable of doing. And so it's very exciting that we're able to actually have Todd on campus and to be able to talk about Vivint and what Vivint has done and, and uh, how you can uh, uh, actually take some of the same innovative principles and uh, chase your own dreams and your own exciting future. So I'm um, just going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, so Todd is the CEO and, as you know, the founder of Vivint, the leading provider of smart home technology. He founded Vivint because he saw an opportunity to sell high-quality products using a personal approach at home. And under his leadership, Vivint has evolved from a groundbreaking idea into one of the fastest growing home technology service companies in the world with nearly 900,000 customers and almost 7,000 employees. His market vision and leadership enabled Vivint to achieve 825% of customer growth between 2005 and 2010. And then in 2012, in September, the Blackstone Group acquired Vivint for an excess of $2 billion giving Vivint the resources to continue expanding and developing uh, new services. And this is where you may or may not know Vivint. As I was talking with Todd earlier, and we were talking about the technology arm of Vivint and some of the leading things that they're doing that literally no company in the state and probably no company in the U.S. Uh, can be its technology equal in several different areas. I'm sure you'll learn about some of that today. Um, so this pattern of growth has continued and allowing Vivint to climb to the number four ranking on the SDM top 100 list of largest residential security installation monitoring organizations and in 2013 was listed number 46 on Forbes annual ranking of America's most promising companies. That's a pretty good uh, uh, number. And as a result of his efforts to, in the business world and in the community, Todd was named the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2010. Um, the award recognizes outstanding entrepreneurs who are building and, and leading dynamic growing businesses. But more than anything, I can tell you that uh, the leaders at Vivint are good people. Um, I know that uh, Todd's partner, Alex, he's my neighbor. I know him very well. Todd teaches gospel doctrine in his, uh, in his uh, ward. And uh, I'm just trying to imagine Todd up teaching gospel doctrine. And I can tell you that uh, it's probably more exciting than uh, if a professor here were teaching it. Uh, I'm sure it has some life. But at any rate, uh, I'm very excited uh, uh, to have Todd uh, join us here at the lecture s series. Let's give him a warm welcome. So um, the first thing, oh man, I get mad so easy. So we got listed, was it 46 on the Forbes uh, most promising companies in 13? That's serious, it, it like upset me so much, which I'm not saying that's positive, that you sh it's not a good attribute, but it made me mad that we got so overlooked. Um, and before I start, um, so we, we did have, we had an acquisition, um, a majority acquisition of the business in 2012 for $2 billion, $10 million, and from 2012 until today, which is you know, two, a little over two years, um, the company's gone from $2 billion to you know, five to five and a half billion market cap. And so I personally think that Forbes got it totally wrong. Um, we should have been ranked in the top five, but that's just me. Um, but you shouldn't have said that because it made me sweat when you said that. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm gonna give you a little bit of um, background on me because I think that's important. And um, I, I re distinctly remember um, sitting in class at BYU. This was back in the late 80s. Who was born in 87 or before 87? No, you weren't. Come on. Was that young? Are you serious? Who else? So that, that's how old I, want, I, I am. I, my first year at BYU was 1987. But even before that, um, I grew up in Idaho, Idaho Falls, Idaho. Um, I had 10 brothers and sisters. My dad was an orthodontist. Um, and 
I think that growing up in such a large family was a massive advantage. It was great, you know, lots of children are, are always around the home. Um, but one of the benefits of so many children is my parents never, well, I, sh I shouldn't say never, but, well, maybe it was because, oh, anyway, we'll talk about me later, but I didn't get attention all the time. My parents didn't, didn't have the time to stand over the top of me to see if I was getting my homework done and if I had practiced this or if I was doing that or if I was running for a class office. We just, we kind of had to survive. We kind of had to find our own way inside of our family and inside of life. We had to go, if we wanted to do something, we kind of had to go do it on our own because there were so many children. My dad was an orthodontist. He was a bishop for years in the state presidency for years. And so not that they didn't love us and care about us, but there's only those of us who have children. There's only so many hours in the day after work and everything that goes on that goes on to pay attention to the children. So I think it was a huge benefit because I had to decide very early on if I wanted to go get something done that I had to do it because I was motivated to do it and I wanted that to happen. So that was a huge blessing. Um, now, um, and again, I'll, I'm just going to tell you anything. And by the way, um, questions and questions are you can ask questions whenever you want about anything you want, and I'll give you what I'll give you the real answer. So be cautious what you ask. Um, and I'm, I'm being very serious. Um, but when I was 14, um, I was a rambunctious kid. I was very curious about life. At 14, um, I was in a boys' home. Uh, very, very difficult child, challenged authority at all times, every time. Um, and yet, at the same time, my parents instilled, which sounds a bit weird, but instilled work ethic um, in each of us as children. Um, I got good grades. I played sports. I just had this curious side to me that, that uh, ended up um, allowing me go, to go to Lowell Benyon's Boys Home in Wyoming. So that was an interesting experience, but a good one. Um, it actually taught me what I didn't want to end up becoming. So um, graduated high school um, and then came down to BYU, and, uh, which was a whole new um, interesting experience for me. Um, my freshman year, uh, truthfully, it was kind of a, a retaking classes I'd already taken in high school, um, you know, advanced classes in, in whatever, you know, math or whatever. So I spent, an, and I'm just giving you full download, but immense amount of time perfecting my, my skiing skills. Um, I became, my freshman year, a great skier. I, I played basketball in high school, so I didn't get to ski that much, so I took full advantage my freshman year. So I, I then, um, and has anyone skied, if you guys skied, you guys probably don't ski a lot or have fun. Anyone in here? No, I don't know. Um, so had a blast my, my, my freshman year, um, didn't go to class much, but um, still made it through. And in fact, your mom, this, so this is my nephew right here. His mom got me in trouble. Your mom got me in trouble. I came off my mission, and my dad's like, well, you flunked out of your freshman year. Um, and this is like days after my mission. He's like, you're going to have to get your grades up. Because I, I had classes with his mom, um, poli sci, calculus. It was my freshman year, and I never went to class. I just went skiing. And so she was ratting me out at, to my parents that I wasn't going to class. So they assumed I got bad grades, which I didn't. But I actually have never gotten on to your mom about that. But anyway, <laughs> Lynette got me in trouble. Um, dang, it just popped into my brain. What's up, man? Um, so uh, I go on a mission, and uh, I went to the Dominican Republic. And I can tell you that most everything outside of, you know, um, growing up with my parents, and my parents were great examples of um, patience and kindness. And, and th these, these, you can ask Clayton if you want, but my, my parents are like the most patient humans on the planet, the kindest, nicest people. I've never heard them speak ill of anyone ever, 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 ever. Is that not true about grandma and grandpa? Nicest people ever. So I learned, you know, a lot of just the basics of life and, and you know, great, through great example of my parents. But my mission, my mission was um, critically important to um, me as a businessman, which sounds a little bit strange. Um, and, unless you go back and you meet my mission president, who's um, one of my lifelong best, best friends, We've been business partners um, since about three years after I served my mission. We became business partners. Um, he's, he's from Logan, uh, Utah. But anyway, um, 
I spent, obviously, you know, most of my waking hours on um, missionary work and becoming, trying to become a better missionary and work hard and instill work ethic and, and those, all of the right things inside of the mission. But my mission president was, um, it was interesting. He, he um, constantly talked to me and others about um, improving and better, bettering ourselves and raising our vision on our capabilities and being brave in, um, in our endeavors and not being satisfied with just getting through life. And, and I'm talking on all fronts, um, in relationships and marriage, um, as, as parents, um, in our jobs, or, you know, with me, he constantly told me, you've got to go create something. You have to, be, you have to get out of life a lot more than you believe you need to get out of life because you, get, you need to get yourself in a position to help other people. If you are just struggling to get by, if you're struggling to pay for a flat tire or an engine repair, or you can barely afford um, to pay your mortgage, how are you going to have the time and the resources to help other people? And he just would grind on me and grind on me nonstop, and I didn't even know what I wanted to do back then. I had no idea whatsoever. By the time I left my mission, I was dead set on the fact that I was gonna, I was gonna own a business, I just didn't know what that business was. And, you know, then reality sets, sets in. I get home from college, and, and my, your, your mom, actually, I'm putting this all together. So I, I get home from my mission. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of upset with your mom right now. Um, this is taking me this many years to figure this out. So I get home from my mission. You guys can help me out here. I have 10 brothers and sisters, and my parents had set aside, uh, like, a little trust fund. Not a lot of money, but a little bit of money to help out with school and education and a car your mom got one I didn't um, and my dad sits me down and it was the same conversation he had with me about um, you know flunking out of my freshman year which I didn't got a 387 um, and he said we're cutting you off you're done you've got to go to school and figure it out on your own we're not going to help you and I'm like well actually my dad said hey we're going to give you a ride to school this is actually what he said and I'm like sweet I wonder what kind of ride I'm going to get I mean my sister got a Civic and and he's like, no, 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 I'm going to give you a ride as in, you're going to get in my car, and I'm going to drive you down to Provo and drop you off. Um, do you have a, a job lined up? And this is like two days after my mission. Do you have a job lined up anywhere to stand? I'm like, I have, I have nothing. I, don't, I have like a backpack from my mission. That's it. So um, anyway, I, I, it, it, at that moment, hunger sets in. This is, this is where the hunger sets in. And he was not joking. He did not give me a dollar, not nothing, zero. Drove me down to Provo. I called my missionary companion. We didn't have cell phones back then. Brent Bartholio, who had just, just, just gotten married. I mean, like four weeks earlier. He had a one-bedroom apartment in a basement. And I said, hey, can I sleep on your couch for a while while I figure out how to you know, get a job? And I can't even, now being married, I can't even believe he said yes, but that was pretty nice. Um, so I... But I became very hungry very fast. I didn't have money for tuition, food, car, nothing, nothing. I was penniless, penniless, literally penniless. So um, the good thing is my parents instilled work ethic in me. I did construction, um, all kinds of work through junior high and high school. Through high school, I always had a part-time job. Even with school, even with sports, I always had some form of a, of a part-time job. So I wasn't afraid to work. I'd done construction. Um, my buddy had a job sheetrocking. He got me a job pretty immediately. I started doing that, started saving every penny, working harder, getting faster, because that's how you, that's how you, you get paid in sheetrocking by what you produce. Um, got myself out of that, out of that place. Ha saved up enough money to pay for my tuition, um, which, again, a bummer is my dad made so much money I couldn't get a Pell Grant because my dad made too much money. It was like my dad was, like, punishing me nonstop for... You know, the, I, and, he, and I deserved it, by the way, as a, as, a, as a child. And when you, some of you have children, you'll understand what I'm talking about. None of you probably were like that, but anyway. So, you know, again, th this, this, this kind of hunger sets in. And, and truthfully, a little bit of an attitude where I'm like, you know what? My dad doesn't, I lost my dad's trust um, as, as, a, as a youth because I was kind of a screwball. I was always, you know, messing around, looking to have a good time and, not always super serious about life. I gotta prove to my dad that, that I have what it takes to take care of myself. 
Um, and again, that hunger, that hunger sets in. And I get a job sheetrocking, and then Brent and I kind of broke off on our own and um, started working, um, getting jobs on our own, bypassed the guy that we were working with. Um, and then I started a house cleaning business. I'm gonna, I gotta fast forward probably just a little bit because of time, but um, a, a, a lady that I knew in Salt Lake had a house cleaning business and she made good money. And I was just looking for ways to pay rent, have a car, pay for gas, insurance, um, tuition, books, all of the, all of the just basics. Um, but, but nonetheless, I was hungry. And I went up to Salt Lake and spent like three days with her cleaning homes, going through the process of, which I grew up cleaning a home. My mom made us do that all the time. Um, you know, cleaning the bathrooms and the process of going through that in the kitchens and scrubbing the floors and doing the whole home. Well, the one thing I did know how to do was um, talk to people. I learned that on my mission. I went up to uh, the homes, all these rich people, like, you know, your professor here. Uh, I'm like, that's a big house. Um, I'm going to go knock on that door and I'm going to sell my home clean, house cleaning services to that home. And, it, you know, the husbands were always gone, and I could, you know, be kind of cutesy with, with, the, you know, with the housewives and, you know, <laughs> play on my poor college student situation. And nonetheless, I, I actually built up a pretty decent business in sheetrocking and in house cleaning and started at least having um, the ability to pay my own way. And, well, I, I did from the start. My parents... They did send me $10 for my, I gotta be totally honest, 10 bucks for my birthday every November 23rd. $10 check from my mom. So I did get some, some help. And by the way, last November 23rd, nice little note from my mom and a $10 check. Um, <laughs> not even kidding. I mean, I, 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 and I cash every one of them and I go spend that, I go spend that up as fast as I can. Um, but I'm, not, I'm being serious too. Right to Taco Amigo and grab a couple tacos on my mom. But so, so you know, again, I, I'm in this, I'm in this, and now, like, I'm reversing myself, thinking about it, and I go to class with a little bit different, is there anyone in here, by the way, that pays 100% their own way? 100%. And, 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 let me, and then, are you, do you get financial assistance? I, I couldn't get any. Um, does anyone do it without any financial assistance? So we've got a couple people in here. It's not that easy, right? I mean, you've got to be, you know, it, sometimes it's tough to get through the day and, and rent comes due pretty soon and tuition's pretty, you know, quite a bit of money and buying books. It's, it, you're actually thinking through every single little thing you're spending. It's pretty tough. Um, so anyway, I'm in this process and I would go to class and I think I had a different perspective than a lot of people in here. My perspective was, and I don't know if it was right or wrong, but I'd sit there and listen to my professor, and my thought was, how is this going to help me pay rent? How is this knowledge transfer going to help me improve my skill set to get ahead in the business world, whatever that means, because I didn't actually totally know, you know, right after my mission. Whatever career path I was going to go down, I actually for a moment thought I was going to be a dentist or an orthodontist. My dad was an orthodontist. That changed pretty quickly, but... Um, I had this like thing in my stomach, my gut that, that, and again, I'm not saying this was right or wrong, but it made me question um, the classes I was sitting in and the papers that I was writing and um, a lot. It made me think about it a lot, again, because rent was due and tuition was due. And I was having to write the check out um, and decide, do, do I believe in the education that I'm getting right now or not? Um, so anyway, um, I ended up um, having some friends work for a company in California that, uh, this was back in the summer of 1991. They went and worked for this company um, selling pest control. There were no, you, I'm sure everyone knows about all the summer sales companies around here. They did not exist in the summer of 1991. There weren't any. There was one co company in California, it was a pest, small, small pest control company that hired a few students, mostly local. Um, but uh, like six students to go sell pest control. I tried to go get a job with them because I had fallen off a scaffolding and hurt my shoulder. Um, I couldn't even hang sheetrock anymore, so I was kind of down to just cleaning homes. But they did fairly well financially, and I thought, well, if they can do it, and they're both, from, they're both rich kids, um, and I guarantee I can out, outwork a rich kid every day from Sunday, um, and I still can. Um, but... Uh, if they can do it, I can do it. So I go out and interview with this, um, this owner of this business. His name's Scott. And I, I drove my car all the way out to California, Sacramento, California, 
to interview with him, and he told me no. He said, I, I don't think you can do this. Um, you, you're not what I'm looking for. And, and I, you know, this was, kind of, this was kind of like the Forbes, you know, 46th ranked company, you know, most promising company feeling. Like, my blood starts to boil, I, and I can't even believe this. I mean, I, I moved pipe in high school. I mowed lawns when I was younger. I made pizza. I did, I don't care what it was. And I was currently cleaning people's toilets. And by the way, I saw some of the people that have come through here to speak. I cleaned their toilets um, when I was going through BYU. I'm like, if I can do that and get myself through, I can do this. I guarantee you I can do this. And he still said no. I called him back 10 more times when I got back to Provo, and he said no and stopped calling me. So out of, and again, I'm not saying this is great, but out of anger, probably anger, and my competitive nature and my hunger, I thought, I'm going to go start a company competing in this guy's space, and I'm going to prove to him that I'm good enough to be hired by him. That's, that's, that was my business plan. Um, that was it. I'm not even kidding. Um, that was it. That was, my, that was my purpose of doing it. It wasn't so I can make a lot of money, so I can pay tuition. I thought, Scott is going to reg regret the day he did not hire me. That was, that was, and that was like ingrained in my brain and every breath I took during the day, at least, you know, with work. And so I did. I started my own business, and I was a BYU student at the time. I went to my mom, um, and I said, well, and, and it evolved pretty rapidly, uh, and, and, and how the process went down. Um, and I think this is important, actually. I had an idea in my head, and, and friends of mine, and including my, my, my bishop at the time, who's a total stud, and my first counselor, who's actually in my ward now, Scott Elder, total studs, and they're like, you know, geez, Todd, you're in school, you should focus on this. Um, you know, what are you thinking starting a business like, like, like this? You know, you don't even know what you're doing. Has anyone done it before? And, and I really didn't care. So I went to my mom and I borrowed $5,000 from her because Terminex, um, this big pest control company, had said yes to me hiring some of my friends to go out and sell pest control services, which I didn't even know what that meant at the time. Again, there's no, there are no marketing companies in this area, no summer sales, anything. My mom lent me $5,000. I still remember her writing the check out, $5,000. I was super nervous um, about, about that. Um, and by the way, I paid her back $6,000 at the end of the summer. And she actually told me the other day, she's like, I should have taken equity in the company. Um, but she didn't. But anyway, I did just buy her a house. You know, so that's, I made up a little bit. Um, that's, um, anyway. But um, anyway, so... My mom, my mom lends me this money, and um, my, my only thought is, I, I can't fail. Well, and actually, I couldn't fail. This was a no-fail option. And I know um, you have these, these books here, Nail It and Scale It. This wasn't Nail It and Scale It. This was Nail It or Starve. Write that book. Nail It or Starve. <laughs> um, I didn't have an option. There was, there was no possibility I could fail. I couldn't fail. Um, I still wanted to go to school. I still had rent due. I still had a car payment. Um, and so that, that first summer goes out. I, had, I, I didn't have enough money or resources. I had 13 of my friends that were going to work for me, my roommates and some of my closest friends. My friend Denny Barney, and, and just let me tell you this. What I'm trying to describe to you all is if I can do it, anyone can do it. I promise you. The, the, and these guys will verify, and they're... They'll say this and they'll raise up and say amen, but I'm just average. I'm average smart. I'm average everything, just average everything except tenacity and willpower, and I don't know how to quit. I just do not know how to quit, and failure is not an option. Transition and pivoting, no problem. Change direction, start over in a different, in, build something different, innovate, no problem. Quit, fail. Not an option for me. It never has been an option. I don't, I don't even know what that means. I don't even like to talk about it. Um, so we go out there, and because I'm, I'm just trying to make it through, I call my friend Denny Barney's dad because he was going out with me. And Denny said, hey, my dad's got properties all over the place. Maybe, we, maybe you could stay in one of his properties. I called Dennis Barney, total stud. He's dead. Great man. Great example. But he's, he, he died a little while back, but total stud. And he said, Todd, 
I've got a trailer south of Mesa. It was actually south of Gilbert, way south of Gilbert. It was just out in the fields. It's all probably developed now. I have an old single wide trailer there and I used to have a stud farm that's all shut down. My wife made me shut it down. There's no power, there's no water, but you know, it's a roof over your head and you can stay there for free. So I, I tell my buddies, hey, um, this is awesome. We, get to, we got a place and it's free. We drive down and this thing is, when, I mean, it's, who lives in Phoenix? Or, uh, uh, is it hot in the summertime there? Can you imagine no air conditioning, no, no lights? And no, and no water, running water. We bathed in Denny's. This is, this is gross, but um, we did what we had to do. We bathed in his swimming pool. So when we'd finish working at night, we'd go swim in his pool. They have filters and all that stuff, so it's, it's totally fine, but that's actually what we did. Um, and, and it was one of the greatest experiences ever. I, we were, I was broke and desperate. I had $5,000. That's not funding for a business. That got, that got my guys through a, a week or two weeks of just food. That's all, that's all it provided. And then the whole business and integration process ha started to happen with Terminex. But um, it was amazing. And, and, and I see, uh, you know, I think a lot of you all plan at some point to start your own business, work for a business startup, work for a company that hopefully has an entrepreneur culture to it. That, that you can get in and start um, new projects inside of that business. One of the biggest reasons for failure with, with companies is they, do, they don't think as, uh, of capital as something that's precious. Um, they, you know, and, and by, by the way, it's, this is, it's, it's good and it's bad. Today in this, in this world, if you create an interesting business idea um, and a business plan, and you're, at, you're a decent presenter, you can go raise 500,000 to a million dollars pretty easy. I'm gonna say pretty easy. Back then when I was doing business, it didn't happen like that. It de definitely didn't happen for me in the industry I was in. But that can be a massive detriment because you get money in your hand that you've never had before. You've never controlled budgets before. You've never thought through what when this runs out. Um, what if something doesn't go well? What if we have to pivot or transition? And, and having more money in the bank means you'll spend more, which means you'll make more mistakes, take, you'll take more big risks that could end your business. And so I appreciate the fact that I had zero funding. I mean, I guess 5,000 bucks. I had $5,000 and that was it until 2006. So from 92 to 2006, zero funding. Every single bit of funding that we had came through myself and then eventually people that worked with me and people I brought on as partners reinvesting every single dollar we made back into the business. Everything. Um, when, when my wife first married me and I'd already started the business, um, I can tell you, um, 